Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today, we are honored to welcome Alberta's newest mayor to the show from the village of Barron's, Alberta, Mayor Clinton Bishop. Clinton, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, Clinton, I'm going to start the uh, questions off with the same question I've asked every other municipal leader who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? I actually had this sense of duty for most of my career, in fact. Uh, straight out of university, I actually went into municipal government. In Alberta, we have what's called the Municipal Internship Program, and it was designed to sort of get the feedback wet for new graduates who are looking to enter into senior administrative roles within municipal government. So I started off there, actually, because uh, I've always been drawn to the, the public sector. I prefer helping people with their quality of life rather than helping uh, private sector with their bottom line. So I've always been drawn to that. And from municipal government, I actually jumped to sometimes what, what we call municipal government, the dark side, and that's provincial government. And so I worked in um, Alberta Health Services for a while within the Calgary Zone in Medical Affairs. So I, I stuck to the public sector for quite some time until I decided to um, start a private sector business of my own, <laughs> which was impact focused. And uh, it, uh, it exists out in, in Vancouver. And I still do that um, on the side of my desk, but because I can work fully remotely, I have some capacity and an opportunity came along in Barron's where we've had now our second by-election in this cycle. And as a resident, I felt there was a need for some stability. So I decided to, to step up in this case and run in the latest by-election just to try and make sure that we had a stabilizing force on council since there's been some, some turmoil there. I want to talk about uh, the role as mayor that you have uh, been uh, so lucky to uh, been achieve, but I want to first start with yourself, and I want to talk about who Clinton is. You talk about the duty to serve. You talk about your uh, your business that you own as well, but I want to know, was municipal politics always the politics that you were interested in growing up? Because traditionally, municipal governance and municipal politics isn't really the most, quote unquote, sexy of politics, because it's not where the fight is. It's not where the partisanship is. So was municipal governance always something that had interested you even before that internship? Uh, absolutely not, actually. So <laughs> it, it happened accidentally is the way that it happened. So 
I had always intended to go off to law school. So after high school, I went to university, took political science with the intention of eventually going to law school. But then I took a municipal government course at the University of Lethbridge, um, who was taught by someone that was a counselor in Lethbridge, Jeff Kaufman. And that's sort of what piqued my interest in municipal government. It's an opportunity. I, I know you said sometimes not the most... Um, uh, I'm trying to remember your words exactly. The most sexy. Engaged, <laughs> sexy, thank you. Sexy part of politics. But it's actually one of the most fulfilling, in my opinion, because everything you do within municipal government, you actually get to see the impact on your local residents. When it's at some, a different level, like provincial government or federal government, you're oftentimes, as a cog in the machine, very disconnected from what your impacts are. And that's sort of the unique thing about municipal government is what you do has real world and real time impacts on your neighbors, family, friends, everyone around you in your community. And I think that's a very attractive aspect of municipal government. The president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Scott Pierce, recently said that it's the government of proximity. And I, I, I love that term so much because it does speak to the issues that are going on municipally. So on March 14th, the mayor of Barron's, Alberta, decides to step down. She, They uh, put in their resignation letter and a by-election is called. Now, in the village, there is uh, no one elected as mayor. It is selected, if I'm not mistaken, by council. And you decide to put your name forward. Why yes. in that by-election, in the most recent by-election, because you were just elected, if I'm not mistaken, like four weeks as of recording this ago, what made you decide, because you talk about the stability that you wanted to see, but there was a by-election before that. Why didn't you put your name in then? What was it about this by-election that you said Clinton's voice needs to be at the council table? Yeah, I've always felt that being a bit of a younger person, there's there's always been a desire amongst a generation to participate in council. And I, I've always let them because I'm busy doing my own things. I have my business. I work full time for the government still as well. So this is another thing to add to my plate. And there's, there's very competent, passionate people in town. So I've always left it to those who have that time to be able to devote to it. But when we've had, when we had a second by-election call, that's when as a resident, I said, okay, this, th we can't go through this again. And even during my campaign, I said, you know, if, if in the event I don't win and we end up in another <laughs> by-election situation, which is a very real possibility in a, in a small village like this, I mean, at that point, I would say that we're no longer even a sustainable municipality <laughs> to have that many by-elections. Two is, is unusual when you only have three members on a council. That's, that's kind of unheard of. So it really, it drove me to then step up because I, I know I have that experience working in municipal government. I have that experience in provincial government. I have that experience being executive within my own company that it's time to just bring those talents to my local community because I want to see it thrive and survive. So what was the big pressing issue? Because we can talk about the, the fact that there had been two by-elections since the last general municipal election that happened across Alberta. But what are the issues that you saw in the village that you said, OK, these are the issues that we need to address so that way we don't get folded into another municipality or the municipal district around us and we can thrive as a village that we can stand on our own two feet? Yeah, so we're very much at an inflection point as a village. I think we've actually been there for a little while. We're in, to be quite frank, I think we're in a bit of a rut when I was a kid living here, Barron's was a very vibrant, because I've been here my entire life. I started out in the country, so just five minutes out of town, but Barron's has always been my hometown. And I moved into town, um, gosh, coming up in like eight years now, but <laughs> time flies. So it's always been my hometown. I've always loved it. And it was such a vibrant place growing up. We had a lot of community events, activities. It's just a very active community. But over time, that has shifted quite a bit. And there's many reasons for that. As that's progressed, the, the village has struggled and many places do. The village has always struggled with things like infrastructure. <laughs> and that's a huge thing for us. And at, we're almost at the point in the village where we don't have a sustainable way forward with the infrastructure we have in town. And that's a big thing for me right now. We need to be doing some long-term planning on that. And I think I might end up having to rattle some cages at the at the provincial level because we have many things we need to fix. 
Um, roads are a huge issue. Water lines, huge issue. We have an incredible, a cr incredible amount of ground contamination from all the oil services and for service stations and shops that used to exist in town. And we can't do a lot of our infrastructure work unless we do remediation, but we don't have our partners stepping up to the table with us, provincial government to help with this. Very much, very much an inflection point where we have to do these things, or we're going to have to look at some really hard truths that are in front of us and make tough decisions. During the by-election, when you were out door knocking and talking to the residents of the village, were these the issues that were being brought up that the village is at an inflection point? Because when I talk to municipal leaders from across Canada, traditionally, and I, I, I hate to paint a broad brush stroke here, but it, it's true, the average resident doesn't understand the jurisdictions that villages, towns, provincial and federal governments deal with. So when you were knocking on doors, were you hearing more of these individual micro village issues or were they more macro provincial or federal issues that were coming up? They're very much on the micro side, um, but they tie into to what I'm talking about, which is this long term sustainability of the village. Most of the commentary was around the infrastructure, everything from the roads to water pipes. Like our water pressure is so low because our pipes are so old, they can't crank it up. <laughs> because they're worried about pipeline bursts. So th there's a very common thread when I spoke to everyone, because I door knocked. So I knocked on every door in town when I ran. So I had a chance to, whenever I got an answer, uh, to speak to people what, what they liked about the community, what they would like to see changed about the community. If they had anything that they considered a big win for us, anything they considered a big pain point. And the common issues were around infrastructure, but nothing that, speaks more in the, the macro sense on the relationships between government. Do you find it difficult to, because I know you're relatively new in the position of councillor and as mayor of the village. So this question may be uh, unable, you may not be able to answer it, but I want to ask it anyway, because I want to get your thoughts on it. Do you see your role as mayor of your village in addressing not just the micro issues, but also the macro issues that the province is not helping out with uh, infrastructure funding, the province isn't helping out with healthcare funding? Is it your job and your responsibility now to not just talk about those micro issues that are going on in the village, but also the macro issues that your village is facing from jur jurisdictional downloading. I think there is an opportunity for me to be doing that. And I think that if I speak to some of my peers in other municipalities, they would probably agree. <laughs> and speaking of the macro issues benefits us at a local level. So for example, if I'm going to be wanting to tackle the ground contamination that we have on main street here, that's gonna require provincial help. There's no way we can afford to do something like that. But I need to rattle some cages about, about things like, so the government is going to be putting $20 billion to private sector oil companies to do cleanup. Maybe you could spare a couple million so barons can clean up their main street so it doesn't smell like oil on a hot day. <laughs> is it actually? Oh yeah, I just walked to the village office the other day and I can smell oil. We have monitoring stations throughout town that the province has installed. We have a significant ground contamination issue in town, but there's no way that a village of our size can ever afford to repair things like that. So Main Street, for example, every time the road needs work, all we can do is throw asphalt on top of bad asphalt. Because as soon as we put a shovel in the ground, Alberta environment mandates that we do remediation, but we don't have millions of dollars to be contributing to remediation because then that'd be our entire budget for the year. You have been in the position for some a uh, little just over a month now. I can imagine when you ran, you probably weren't running to think that you'd be the mayor of your village, but you are the mayor of the village now. Um, do you put a little bit more weight in the responsibility of talking about these issues more passionately than you would have if you were just a councillor or one of the other two councillors on your uh, council? No, I, I would be just as passionate about it. <laughs> if I weren't mayor, I'd probably be a bit of an annoyance to whoever might did you, be. Did you run wanting to be mayor? And I, I hate to ask that question because the person who resigned on March 14th was the mayor, but he was elected as a councillor. So when you ran, did you think you would be mayor or did you just run to be a councillor? 
Um, I thought there was a strong potential I could be mayor because I have a lot of passionate ideas about it. I was ready. I was ready to. Uh, I had my whole pitch and everything lined up for when we had to decide who was going to be mayor at the organizational meeting. And I was ready to go. I, I was ready to go hard on wanting to be mayor. So I guess I always assumed that there was a very strong chance I could. But going into it, you're just elected to council. So you have to be satisfied with that. If you run for council in a municipality where the council elects the mayor and you go in assuming you're going to be a mayor, you're going about it the wrong way. You now take over the responsibility of leading your village through some pretty tough decisions, it sounds like, whether it be remit remuneration uh, or even the financial issues that a lot of municipalities are facing right now. How do you see your role as mayor of the village in balancing the needs of the community versus the realities that we currently live in? So I think I'm going to become a bit of a sacrificial lamb. I expect that. <laughs> <laughs> I've I, never I, heard it called that way, but I, I love it. Let's go down this path there, Clinton. I fully expect that I am going to ruffle some feathers over the next two years because we're we're going to be coming up in an election. I'm not going to have a full four-year mandate with this mandate. Um, so I expect I'm going to have to ruffle some feathers as we go, um, always for the greater good. My end goal by the time my term concludes is that we have a long-term plan to move forward with. Whether I'm still on council or not, I would like to be able to end this term with some sort of plan forward that no one's going to be perfectly satisfied with, but at least it is a pathway that we can look at. Uh, so what does that path of... forward look like? So let's let's put it on the record right here, right now, because then in two years time, I can come back to you and say, Clinton, let's chat again. <laughs> so what does that path forward look like to you as mayor of the Village of Barons? Yeah, so I would like to see probably a 10 to 15 year capital improvement plan, because it's going to take a long time for us to be tackling a lot of the infrastructure. We're, we're not going to be able to fund it easily, so we have to spread things out as much as possible. That's the biggest nugget I would like to leave at the end of my term if I'm not reelected. Um, that, that's a big one for me. I'd also like to see a big shift in how our local government engages with citizens. We're very old school here, and I think that if we can improve our relations with the local citizens, it's going to create a better understanding of what we do within the municipality. Because one of the other common things I heard when I would door knock is, you know, my taxes are so high. And I'm like, yep, they are, but you know, you need to understand where all those dollars are going. And when we're just almost entirely a residential community, like you have to bear the burden as the taxpayer. We don't have a commercial or industrial sector to be taking on to take on some of that load. So yeah, your taxes are kind of high. We're a small town with a lot of services to provide. <laughs> and people don't understand always that connection. So I would like to see a better relationship as well by the by the end of this term with our citizens. And I, there's a couple of quick wins for that. We've already changed when, when our council meetings occur because they were happening at 1 p.m. On, uh, on Tuesdays. And people would say to me, well, I can't, I can't attend that because they're not broadcast, they're not recorded. It's during a work day. So, you know, order first order of the day when I'm elected is we changed our meetings to 7 p.m. so more people can attend. And we're already exploring how we can broadcast online. So lots are of little get, things. Are like you that. getting people attending? Because again, municipal governance is not sexy. So I, I've worked in municipal governments and I, I can tell you that there's the average reporter and there's that one uh, family who usually shows up because either they have nothing to do that night or they're just so passionate about their community. Are people willing to show up to the council meetings? Well, at 1 p.m., yes, we had a few regulars. Now, I'm hoping, because I have done what the what the citizens have asked for and changed the time, I'm hoping that they now come out as promised. <laughs> we'll, we'll see, because we haven't had a 7 p.m. meeting yet. So, um, I want to talk about the village as a whole now, because I am cautious of time, and we're about 20 minutes into this already, and I said I'd keep you for a half hour, because I know you, as the life of a mayor, is quite busy. And I want to know from you, and I think we've already touched on it a little bit, but I want to go into it a little bit more. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the village today? And how do you see your role? And we talk about the time frame. We talk about uh, tangible items that I, I like to talk about. Well, how do you see yourself in the role as mayor in addressing that issue today? 
Yeah, so I'd back to the sustainability of the village. That's our biggest issue is our long-term viability and sustainability. Right now we're we're just chugging along in the rut we've been in for probably the last decade. Um, but that can't that can't be the way that we continue. And I think that's our biggest issue and the thing that I need to tackle as best as I can by the end of this term. So what is the rut you're talking about? What what type of rut? Is it just the mindset that residents have? Is it the uh, non-growth factor that people uh, the municipality isn't seeing that you wish it was seeing? What is the rut? And, I, and I'm going to hold you to this answer here because I, I think we need to discuss that because people listening might go, what's he talking about? Is, there, is the village just a desolate town where no one wants to go? But it doesn't seem that way because you're there. Yeah, so it's not definitely not a desolate town, but when I say it's in a rut, we're very much in sort of a maintenance and status quo mode as a village. And so we get by with our budget doing the little things we can to keep the village as viable as possible. But we don't have that long term vision of what are we going to do to tackle the big things that are on the horizon. So we can't rely on the provincial government to come along all the time with grants. Like We need a new sewer lift station. Yeah, they came through with a grant on that. But we don't have long-term plans for when are we replacing roads? When are we replacing water lines? When are we replacing sewer lines? When are we going to look at expanding the village at some point? Because we're almost at we're almost at capacity with our our land base. So we need we need to have some of those long-term things. Right now we're just very much a business as usual approach to things because we're constrained in a couple of areas. Do you think residents are willing to have that conversation? Because there's a lot of nimbyism in this country, and I'm assuming it does affect your community as well, that people are comfortable with the way things are. People don't want big change because they like the, the small town atmospheres. And I lived in a small town, and I can tell you, even when they paved a road, there was a lot of uproar because it took away the feel of that small town. So how do you as mayor balance the needs of people who want the community to stay the same with your vision of moving and progressing the city for the village forward? I think in, in all honesty, Barron's is not going to see explosive growth. So I don't think we're going to see any of that. Nimbyism. Never say never. <laughs> I, there, there's too many other communities around us that are seeing the growth. And so Nobleford is a great example, just down the road for years, they had like no taxes. <laughs> And so it was a very attractive community to live in. It was a very bizarre, unsustainable approach to governance, in my opinion. But very they did much. it. <laughs> Saw explosive growth. You can't you can't rely on growth to fund everything you do forever. Barron's has seen slow, pretty sustainable growth over its life lifespan. We've never seen an explosion in population, an explosion in development. We've had more residences built in the last ten years than we've seen in a little bit. So we've seen some growth but we need to continue that managed growth. Nobody had any issues with any of the growth we've seen over the last however many years. People I think have been quite happy about it because at the end of the day, it's more taxpayers to spread things out across. So <laughs> we, we you're have- speaking my ability. love language, Clinton. You're speaking my love language. <laughs> we, we have the ability to grow and we haven't seen resistance to growth. We've only seen resistance in some areas where it's been industry trying to pop up because people don't like noise and nuisance at the end of the day, but I I don't see a ton of resistance to some of the growth and change that needs to happen in town. Well, that that's good, but you need to be out there advocating for your community. You have to be out there pitching your community, not just in settings like this, but at major industrial fairs. Uh, do you have the time to do it? Because as someone who owns their own business, as someone who is a uh, village mayor, I can imagine that takes up a lot of your time already. But now you're out promoting your community as a destination for people to come and build and come and live. Uh, do you think you can do it? I'm very confident I can do it. <laughs> so with my with my other work, it's entirely flexible what I do. So I work from home predominantly. I have the ability to reschedule things as I need to. So next week, I have a Community Futures AGM during the day. No issue attending things like that. So when it comes time to be attending industry events or conferences or even other communities, there's zero issues there. And I'm actually looking forward to it because I think that I, I can be a good voice for Barron's. We're a very small village. So, you know, you sometimes What's have the population have... right now, because I saw online in the last census was 2016. that said it was like roughly about 300, if I'm not mistaken, has it grown or is it roughly still the same about that? 
Yeah, we're in about the 325, 350 range, I believe. So we're still a small village, but um, I have to be willing because we're a smaller player in the in the area. Uh, we just have to have a bit of a louder bark as a result. So, I love the metaphor there. I want to turn to my last subject, and it's the one that I, I love the most because I love touring and I love visiting communities. As a tourist who is going to be coming through Barrens later on this, actually probably in about two weeks by the time this airs, um, where should I stop and what should I do in the village or in the surrounding community as some tourist destinations that you would love to put on the map? Yeah, for sure. So if you like water sports, we have Kehoe Lake just south of town. Um, it used to hold the world record for windsurfing speed because we get I mean, it's Alberta. We get so much wind out here. <laughs> so that's just two minutes south of town. Um, and then in town, if you're a movie buff, the school um, here in Barron's was used for the Smallville School in the original Superman. Uh, and this year is the 45th anniversary for the Superman movie. So at our July 8th Family Fun Day, um, it's very... Superman focused in honor of the 45th anniversary of that film. So Barron's was Smallville in the original Superman movie. Uh, now that I know that, I'm going to be coming there with all my Superman swag. So uh, I'm looking <laughs> forward to possibly meeting you on the 8th of July then. Um, but where do you go after a stressful day, after a long day of work, after even a few council meetings under your belt now, after a long council meeting, where do you go in the village or in the surrounding area to decompress? Yeah, so one of the things that I like to do, uh, I have I take pride in my yard and house, and I try to be a good example in town. So I like to spend a lot of time <laughs> putting around and taking care of it. Um, so it's nice to have that quiet time, too. So I used to split my time fairly significantly between Vancouver and here when I was a lot more hands-on, not needing to be as remote in my business. And one thing you realize when you have grown up in a small place and then go to a city is just how much noise pollution there is and the toll that takes on you. So to be able to be here in Barrens, enjoy the peace and quiet, it's incredibly relaxing to be able to do that. And because we're sort of between Lethbridge and Calgary, I have options if I do want to venture into a larger center. Lethbridge is 30 minutes away. Calgary is about an hour 45 away. So I have all of those things right at my doorstep. I want to ask the million dollar question now, and this is the most important one and it gets to know what the village is all about. But in your opinion, Clinton, what is the, what is the uniqueness that is the village of Barrens. I think the uniqueness is we're in a bit of a Goldilocks zone. So we're far enough from major urban centers that our cost of living is low enough. You can afford to own a home out here. You can afford to have that quiet lifestyle that you may want to raise your family in or retire into. Or if you're someone like me and you can work remotely, you know, it's fantastic. I don't have to have a mortgage, right? I can afford to do everything I want to do without the burden of high rent or an expensive home. So we're in this beautiful Goldilocks zone, in my opinion, that if you're if you're wanting that quiet lifestyle to retire, to raise a family, or just to be a professional worker who can work remotely, Barron's is a great destination for that. Mayor Bishop, Clinton, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking a half out of your half hour out of your day and doing this. Um, and I say this with sincerity, thank you for stepping up. Thank you for serving your community. I think municipal politicians do not hear that enough because they are, as uh, Scott Pierce would say, the government of proximity. So thank you so much for doing what you do and being a part of your community and serving in this capacity and helping your community grow. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for having this podcast where we get a platform to actually talk about some of these things because like you've pointed out, people often don't understand what happens at the different jurisdictional levels. So it's an opportunity to talk about that. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with someone in real life. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be better people. So with that, we'll be back for another episode of the Crossboard Interviews later. Talk to you then.